Ernst Jünger's Storm of Steel. Chapter 4. Duty and Monchi. Two weeks later, my wound was healed. I was released to the reserve battalion in Hanover and was given a short home leave there to get used to walking again. Why not report as a gentleman cadet? My father suggested to me on the first of my mornings at home as we were walking round the orchard to see how the trees would bear. And I did as he suggested. Even though it had seemed much more attractive to me at the beginning of the war to be a simple rifleman, responsible only for myself. So the regiment sent me off to Duberets on another course, which I left six weeks later with the rank of ensign. From the hundreds of young men who had come from all over Germany, I could tell that the country was not short of good fighting stock. While the training I received in recuperance had been directed at the individual, here we were instructed in various ways of moving across terrain in small groups. In September 1915, I traveled back to my regiment. I left the train in the village of saint Leger, the divisional headquarters, and marched at the head of a small detachment of reservists to Duchy, where the regiment was based. Ahead of us, the French autumn offensive was in full swing. The front manifested itself as a long, billowing cloud over open country. Overhead, the machine guns of the air squadrons pattered away. Sometimes, when one of the French planes came down very low, their colorful rosettes seemed to scan the ground like big butterflies' eyes. My little troop and I took cover under the poplars that lined the road. The anti-aircraft guns threaded long, fleecy lines through the air, and whistling splinters pinged into the tilth. This long march was to give me an opportunity of putting my newly acquired skills into practice right away. We knew we had been spotted, probably by one of the many captive balloons whose yellow forms glimmered in the western sky, because, just as we were turning into the village of Duchy, the black cone of a shell exploded in our faces. It struck the entrance to the little village cemetery just beside the road. For the first time, I found myself in the position of having to react to an unexpected development with an immediate decision. To the left! An extended order! Quick march! The column spilled out over the fields at the double. We formed up again to the left and entered the village by a large detour. Duchy, where the 73rd rifles were billeted, was a middle-sized village that had not, as yet, suffered much from the war. This place, nestled on the wavy ground of Artois became, over the year and a half of stationary warfare in the region, a kind of second garrison to the regiment, a place of rest and recreation after grueling days of fighting and working on the front line. How many times we drew a deep breath to see the lonely light at the entrance of the village, winking towards us through the black and rainy night. It meant having a roof over our heads again and a bed in the dry. We could sleep without having to go out into the night four hours at later, and without being pursued even into our dreams by the fear of a surprise attack. It made us feel reborn on the first day of a rest spell, when we'd had a bath and cleaned our uniforms of the grime of the trenches. We exercised and drilled out into the meadows to return suppleness to our rusty bones, and to reawaken the esprit de corps of individuals isolated over the long watches of the night. That gave us the ability to resist during the long and taxing days ahead. At first, the companies took it in turns to march to the front for work on the fortifications. The strenuous double roster was dropped later on, on the orders of our understanding Colonel von Open. The security of a position depends less on the elaborate construction of its approach routes and the depths of its firing trench than on the freshness and undiminished courage of the men defending it. For off hours, Duchy had much to commend it to its grey inhabitants. Numerous bars were still plentifully provided with eatables and drinkables. There was a reading room, a coffee bar, and, later on, a cinema was improvised from a large barn. Officers enjoyed an excellently equipped mess room in a bowling alley in the rectory garden. There were regular company parties, in which officers and men, in the timeless German fashion, vied with one another in drinking not to forget the killing days, for which the company pigs, kept fat on the refuse from the field kitchens, gave their lives. 
Since the civilian population was still living in the village, it was important to exploit all available space. Gardens were partly taken up with huts and various temporary dwellings. A large orchard in the middle of a village was turned into a public square. Another became a park, the so-called Emischplatz. A barber and dentist were installed in a couple of dugouts covered with branches. A large meadow next to the church became a burial ground to which the company marched almost daily to take the leave of one or more comrades to the strains of mass singing. In the space of a single year, a crumbling rural village had sprouted an army town, like a great parasitic growth. The former peacetime aspect of the place was barely discernible. The village pound was where dragoons watered their horses. Infantry exercised in the orchards. Soldiers lay in the meadows, sunning themselves. All the peacetime institutions collapsed. Only what was needed for war was maintained. Hedges and fences were broken through or simply torn down for easier access, and everywhere there were large signs of giving directions to military traffic. While roofs caved in and furniture was gradually used up as firewood, telephone lines and electricity cables were installed. Cellars were extended outwards and downwards to make bomb shelters for the residents. The removed earth was dumped in the gardens. The village no longer knew any demarcations or distinctions between thine and mine. The French population was quartered at the edge of the village towards Manchi. Children played on the steps of dilapidated houses, and old people made hunched figures, slinking timidly through the new bustle that had remorselessly evicted them from the places where they had spent entire lifetimes. The young people had to stand to every morning and were detailed to work the land by the village commandant, First Lieutenant Obolanta. The only time we had come in contact with the locals was when we brought them our clothes to be washed, or when we went to buy butter and eggs. One of the more remarkable features of this army town was the way a couple of young orphaned French boys followed the troops around. The two boys, of whom one was eight or so, the other twelve, went around clad entirely in field gray, and both spoke fluent German. They referred to their compatriots, as the soldiers did, as shangos. Their keenest desire was to go with their company to up to the line. They drilled faultlessly, saluted their superior officers, formed up on the left flank for roll call, and put in for leave when it was time to accompany the kitchen helpers on shopping expeditions to Cambrai. When the 2nd Battalion went to Kient for a couple of weeks of instruction, one or two, Louis, was ordered by Colonel von Oppen to remain behind in Duchy. No one spotted him anywhere on the way, but when the battalion arrived, there he was, leaping happily just out of the baggage cart where he had been hiding. The elder of the two, I was told, was later sent to Petty Officer School in Germany. Barely an hour's march from Duchy lay Monchi Aubois, where the regiment's two reserve companies were billeted. In the autumn of 1914, it had been bitterly fought over and had ended up in German possession. As the battle slowly fought to a standstill in a half circle round the ruins of this once affluent town, now the houses were burned down and shot up. The neglected gardens raked by shells and the fruit trees snapped. The rubble of stone had been heaped into a defensive installation with the aids of trenches, barbed wire, barricades, and concrete strong points. All the approaching roads could be covered by machine gun fire from the pillbox called Torgau Redoubt. Another strong point went by the name of Altenberg Redoubt, an entrenched post to the right of the village that was home of a detachment of company reservists. Also pivotal to the defense was a quarry that in peacetime had provided the limestone for the village houses, and which we had stumbled upon rather by chance. A company cook, who had lost his water pail in the well, had himself lowered in after it, and after noticing a spreading cavern-like hole, the place was investigated and, after a second entrance had been knocked through, it offered bomb-proof accommodation for a large number of fighters. On the isolated heights on the way to Ransart was the ruins of a one-time estimant dubbed Bellevue on account of the wide view of the front that it afforded from it. And this was a place I came to love, in spite of its exposed situation. From there, the view stretched over the dead land, whose defunct villages were linked by roads that had no traffic on them.
and on which no living creature was to be seen. In the distance glimmered the outline of the abandoned city of Arras, and round to the right the shining chalk mine craters of St. Eloi. The weedy fields lay barren under the passing clouds and the shadows of clouds, and the tightly woven web of trenches spread its little white and yellow links secured by lengthy communication trenches. From time to time, there was a puff of smoke from a shell lobbed into the air as if by a ghostly hand, or the ball of a shrapnel hung over the wasteland like a great white flake slowly melting. The aspect of the landscape was dark and fantastic. The war had erased anything attractive or appealing from the scene and etched its own brazen features to appall the lonely onlooker. The desolation of the profound silence, sporadically broken by the crump of shells, were heightened by the sorry impression of devastation. Ripped haversacks, broken rifles, scraps of cloth, counterpointed grotesquely with children's toys, shell fuses, deep craters from explosions, bottles, harvest implements, shredded books, battered household gear, holes whose gaping darkness betrayed the presence of basements, where the bodies of the unlucky inhabitants of the houses were gnawed on by particularly assiduous swarms of rats, a little espaliered peach tree despoiled of its sustaining wall, and spreading its arms pitifully in the cattle byres and stables and barns, the bones of livestock still dangling from their chains, trenches dug through the ravaged gardens, in among sprouting bulbs of onions, wormwood, rhubarb, narcissus, buried under weeds, on the neighboring fields grain barns, through whose roofs the grain was already sprouting, all that, with a half-buried communication trench running through it, and all suffused with the smell of burning and decay. Sad thoughts were apt to sneak up on the warrior in such a locale, when he thinks of those who only recently led their lives in tranquility. As already mentioned, the front line described a semicircle around the village, connected to it by an array of communication trenches. It was divided in two, Machi South and Machi West. These, in turn, were formed up into six company sections, from A to F. The bulge in the front afforded the British a good opportunity for flanking fire, the skillful use of which occasioned us heavy losses. They deployed a gun hidden immediately behind their own lines that sent us little shrapnels, which seemed to be fired and to reach us practically simultaneously. Out of the blue, a hail of lead balls would flash down over a length of our trench, as often as not, taking a century with it. Next, we would take a quick turn through the trenches, as they were at time, to familiarize the reader with some of the reoccurring terminology. To reach the front line, the firing trench, we take one of the many saps, or communication trenches, whose job it is to afford the troops some protection on their way to battle stations. These often very long trenches are broadly perpendicular to the front, but to make it less easy to rake them with fire, they most often followed a zigzag or curving course. After a quarter of an hour's march, we entered the second trench, the support trench, which is parallel to the firing trench and serves as a further line of defense should that be taken. The firing trench is wholly unlike the frail constructions that were dug out in the early days of the war, nor is it just a simple ditch either, but it is dug to a depth of 10 or 20 feet. The defenders move around as on the bottom of a mine gallery. To observe the ground in front of the position, or to fire out, they climb a set of steps or a wide wooden ladder to a sentry platform, which is set at such a height in the earth that a man sitting on it is a head taller than the top of the rampart. The marksman stands at his sentry post, a more or less armored niche, with his head protected by a wall of sandbags or a steel plate. The actual lookout is through tiny slits through which a rifle barrel is pushed. The quantities of earth that were dug out of the trench are piled up in a wall behind the trench, a parados affording protection from the rear. Machine gun emplacements are built into these earthworks. On the front side of the trench, 
the earth is kept level so as to keep the field of vision as clear and uncluttered as possible. In front of the trench, often in multiple lines, is a wire entanglement, a complicated web of barbed wire designed to keep the attacker busy so that he presents an easy target for defensive sentries. Rank weeds climb up and through the barbed wire, symptomatic of a new and different type of flora taking root on the fallow fields. Wildflowers, of a sort that generally make only an occasional appearance in grain fields, dominate the scene. Here and there, even bushes and shrubs have taken hold. The paths, too, are overgrown, but easily identified by the presence on them of round-leaved plantains, that is, the German Wegerisch, the weed plantain, entomologically derived from the French plante, sole of the foot which flourishes along footpaths rather than the tropical vegetable of the same name from the Spanish plantano, banana. Bird life thrives in such wilderness, partridges, for instance, whose curious cries we often hear at night, or larks, whose choir starts up at first light over the trenches. To keep the firing trench from being raked by flanking fire, it's laid out in a meandering line, forever doubling and tripling back on itself. Each of these turns forms a traverse to catch any shells fired from the side. The fighter is thus protected from behind, from the sides, and, of course, from the front. To rest in, there are many dugouts, which have evolved by now from rudimentary holes in the ground to proper enclosed living quarters, with beamed ceilings and plank-cladded walls. The dugouts are about six feet high and at a depth where the floors are roughly level with the bottom of the trench outside. In effect, there is a layer of earth on top of them thick enough to enable them to survive oblique hits. In heavy fire, though, they are death traps, and it's better to be in the depths of the shelters. The shelters are braced with solid wood joists. The first is fixed in the front wall of the trench, level with the bottom, and from this entrance, each successive joist is set a couple of hands breaths lower so that the amount of protection is rapidly increased. By the 13th step, there are nine yards of earth overhead, 12 counting the depth of the trench. Then there are slightly wider frames set straight ahead or perpendicular to the steps. These constitute the actual living quarters. Communication is possible by lateral tunnels. While branchings off, towards the enemy lines are used for mining or listening posts. The whole thing should be pictured as a huge, ostensibly inert installation, a secret hive of industry and watchfulness, where, within a few seconds of an alarm being sounded, every man is at his post. But one shouldn't have too romantic an idea of the atmosphere. There is a certain prevailing torpor that proximity to the earth seems to engender, I was sent to the 6th Company, and, a few days after my arrival, moved into line at the head of the platoon, where I was straightaway welcomed by a few English toffee apples. These are brittle iron shells filled with high explosive, somewhat resembling fruit on a stalk, or imagine a 50-kilogram dumbbell with one of its weights missing. They went off with a muffled thud and, moreover, were often masked by machine gun fire. It, therefore, made an eerie impression on me when sudden flames lit up the trench just next to us, and a malignant wave of air pressure shook us. The men quickly pulled me back into the platoon dugout, which we were just passing. We felt the next five or six mortar thumps from within. The mine doesn't actually impact. It seems more to nestle down. The calmness of its devastation was somehow more unsettling. The following day... When I first inspected the trench by daylight, I saw those big emptied steel casings hanging up by their stalks outside dugouts, serving as alarm dogs. C sector, which our company held, was the regiment's most forward sector. In Lieutenant Brecht, who had hurried back from the United States at the outbreak of war, we had the very man to defend such a position. He loved danger, and he died in battle. Life in the trenches was a matter of unbending routines. I will now describe the course of a single day of the kind that we had, one after another, for a year and a half. 
except when normal levels of fire were intensified to what we called turbulence. Day in the trenches begins at dawn. At seven o'clock, someone from my platoon comes in to wake me from my afternoon nap, which, with a view to night duty, I like to have. I buckle on my belt, stick a very light pistol in it and some bombs, and leave my more or less cozy dugout. As I walk through the by now highly familiar sector, I automatically check that the sentries are all in position. The password is given in low tones. By now, it is nighttime, and the first silvery flares climb aloft. While peeled eyes scrutinize no man's land, a rat skitters about among the tin cans thrown over the ramparts. Another joins in in a squeak, and, before long, the whole place is swarming with the lithe of shapes emerging from their holes in ruined village basements or among the shot-up bomb shelters. Hunting rats is a much-loved change from the tedium of sentry duty. A piece of bread is put out as bait, and a rifle is leveled at it, or gunpowder from dud shells is sprinkled in their holes and torched. Then they come squeaking out with singed fur. They are repellent creatures, and I'm always thinking of the secret desecrations they perform on the bodies in the village basements. Once, as I was striding through the ruins of Manchi on a warm night, they came oozing out of their hiding places in such indescribable numbers that the ground was like a long carpet of them, patterned with the occasional white of an albino. Some cats have moved in with us from the ruined villages around. They love the proximity of humans. One large white tom with a shot-off front paw is frequently seen ghosting about in no man's land, and seems to have been adopted by both sides. Of course, I was telling you about trench duty. But one loves these digressions. It's an easy matter to start nattering, to fill up a dark night and the slow hours. I would many times stop and listen to the tales of some character from the front or fellow NCO and take in his chatter with rapt attention. As an ensign, I am often engaged in conversation by a kindly duty officer who suffers equally from the boredom. Yes, the men even gets to be quite poly, talks in a soft, low voice, reveals secrets and desires, and I attend because I too feel oppressed by the heavy black walls of the trenches. I too am yearning for warmth, for something human in the eerie desolation. At night, the landscape emanates to a curious cold, a sort of emotional cold. It makes you start to shiver when you cross an unoccupied part of the trench that is reserved for the sentries. And if you cross the wire entanglements and set foot in no man's land, the shivering intensifies to a faint, teeth-rattling unease. The novelists haven't done justice to this teeth-chattering. There's nothing dramatic about it. It's more like having a feeble electric current applied to you. Most of the time, you're just unaware of it, as you are talking in your sleep at night, and, for another thing, it stops the moment anything actually happens. The conversation winds down. We are tired. Sleepily, we stand in a fire bay, propped against a trench, and stare out, cigarettes glimmering in the dark. When there's frost, you stomp up and down so hard that the earth echoes. The sound of incessant coughing carries for miles through the cold air. Often enough, if you're creeping toward it in no man's land, that coughing is your first warning that you're nearing enemy trenches. Or a sentry will be whistling or humming to himself, in contrast to yourself creeping up on him with murderous intent. Or again, it's raining, in which case you stand sadly with your collar turned up under the eaves of the dugout entrance listening to the regular drip, drip, drip. But if you hear that footfall of a superior on the duckboards, you step out smartly, walk on, suddenly swing about, click your heels together, and report, NCO on duty, sector all quiet, sir. Because standing in doorways is not permitted. Your thoughts drift. You look at the moon and think of lovely, cozy days at home, or of the big city miles to the rear where people are just now streaming out of the cafes, 
big arc lamps light up the lively commotion of the city center. It feels like something in a dream, incredibly remote. Something rustles in front of the trench. A couple of wires clink together. Straight away, all your dreams are out the window. Your senses are stretched to the point of pain. You climb on to the fire step. Fire off a tracer round. Nothing stirs. It must have been a rabbit or a pheasant. Nothing more. Often you can hear the enemy working on his wire entanglements. Then you empty your magazine in his direction. Not only because those are the standing instructions, but also because you feel some pleasure as you do it. Let them feel the pressure for a change. Who knows? Perhaps you even managed to hit one of them. We too go unspooling wire most nights and take a lot of casualties. Then we curse those mean British bastards. On some sectors of the line, say at the sap heads, the sentries are barely 30 yards apart. Here, you sometimes get personally acquainted with your opposite numbers, so you get to know Tommy or Fritz or Wilhelm by his cough or his whistle or his singing voice. Shouts are exchanged, often with an edge of rough humor. Hey, Tommy, you still there? Yep. Then get your head down. I'm about to start shooting you. Sometimes you hear a whistling, flood airing sound, following a dull discharge. Watch out! Trench mortar! You rush to the nearest dugout steps and hold your breath. The mortars explode differently. Altogether more excitingly, than common or garden shells. There's something violent and devious about them, something of personal vitriol. They are treacherous things. Rifle grenades are scaled down versions of them. One rises like an arrow out of the opposite lines, with its reddish brown metal head scored into squares like chocolate to make it splinter better. If the horizon lights up at night in certain places, all the sentries leap up from their posts and take cover. They know from long experience where the mortars trained on Sector C are. At last, the luminous dial shows that two hours are up. Now wake up the relief and head for the dugout. Maybe the ration party will have brought post or a parcel or a newspaper. It's a strange feeling to read news from home and their peacetime anxieties, while the shadows cast by a flickering candle flame brush over the rough low beams. After scraping off the worst of the mud from my boots with a piece of a stick, and giving them a finishing touch against a leg of the, the crudely fashioned table, I lay down on my pallet and pulled the blanket over my head for a quick four-hour gargle, as the slang has it. Outside, the shots monotonously ring against the parapet. A mouse scrabbles over my feet in my hands. Nothing disturbs my sleep. Even the weir beasties don't bother me. It's only a few days since we were we thoroughly fumigated the dugout. Twice more, I am torn from my sleep to do my duty. During the last watch, a bright streak behind the sky to the east announces the coming day. The contours of the trench are sharpened. In the flat light, it makes an impression of unspeakable dreariness. A lark ascends. Its trailing gets on my wick. Leaning against the parapet, I stare out at the dead, wire-scarred vista with a feeling of tremendous disillusion. These last twenty minutes seem to go on forever. At last, there's the clatter of the coffee bringers, coming down the communication trench. It's seven o'clock in the morning. The night watch is over. I head for the dugout and drink coffee and wash in an old herring can. That freshens me up. I no longer want to lie down. At nine o'clock, after all, I need to go to my platoon and give them the day's tasks. We're real reconnaissance men who can turn our hands to anything and the trenches make their thousandfold demands of us every day. We sink deep shafts, construct dugouts and concrete pillboxes, rig up wire entanglements, devise drainage systems, rivets, support, level, raise, and smooth. 
fill in latrines. In a word, we do all possible tasks ourselves. And why wouldn't we? Given that we have the representatives of every rank and calling in our midst? If one man doesn't know, then another will. Only lately a miner took the pick out of my hand as I was working on our platoon dugout and remarked, Keep cutting at the bottom. The dirt at the top will come down by itself. Strange not to have thought of something so elementary oneself, but here, stood in the middle of the bleak landscape, suddenly compelled to take cover, to wrap up against the wind and weather, to knock together beds and tables, to improvise stoves and steps, we soon learned to use our hands. The value of skills and crafts is there for all to see. At one o'clock, lunch is brought up from the kitchens, which are in the basements of Monchi. In large containers, there were once milk churns and jam boilers. The food is of martial monotonous, but plentiful enough, provided the ration parties don't evaporate it on the way and leave half of it on the ground. After lunch, we nap or read. Gradually, the two hours approach that are set aside for trench duty by day. They pass more quickly than their nocturnal counterparts. We observe the front line opposite through binoculars or periscopes, and often manage to get in a headshot or two through the sniper's rifle. But careful, because the British also have sharp eyes and useful binoculars. A sentry collapses, streaming blood, shot in the head. His comrades rip the bandage, roll out from his tunic, and get him bandaged up. There's no point, Bill. Come on, he's still breathing, isn't he? Then the stretcher bearers come along to carry him to the dressing station. The stretcher poles collide with the corners of the fire bays. No sooner that the man disappeared than everything is back to the way it was before. Someone spreads a f few shovelfuls of dirt over the red puddle, and everyone goes back to whatever else they were doing before. Only a new recruit maybe leans against the revetment, looking a little green about the gills. He is endeavoring to pull it all together. Such an incredibly brutal assault. So sudden, with no warning given. It can't be possible. Can't be real. Poor fellow. If only you knew what was in store for you. Or again, it's perfectly pleasant. A few have applied themselves with sportsmanlike enthusiasm with connoisseurial expressions. They follow the bursts of our artillery in the enemy trench. Bullseye! Wow, did you see that dirt go up after that one? Poor old Tommy. There's mud in your eye. They like lobbing rifle grenades and light mortar bombs across to the disapproval of more timorous souls. Come on, stop that nonsense. We're getting enough of our pounding as it is. But that doesn't keep them from pondering incessantly about how best to propel grenades with handmade catapults or some other hellish contraptions to imperil the ground in front of a trench. Now, they might clear a small little passage in the wire in front of our sentry post so that the easy access might lure some unsuspecting scouts in front of our, our sights. Another time, they creep across and tie a bell to the wire on the other side and pull it with a long string to drive the British sentries crazy. They get kicks out of fighting. At tea time, things can get quite cozy. The ensign is often required to provide company for one or more of the other senior officers. Things are done with formality and some style. A couple of china cups on a hessian tablecloth. Afterwards, the officer's batman will leave a bottle and glasses out on the wobbly table. Conversation becomes more personal. It's a curious thing that even here, other people remain the most popular subject of conversations. Trench gossip flourishes in these afternoon sessions, almost as in a small town garrison. Superiors, comrades, and inferiors may all be subjected to vigorous criticism, and a fresh rumor makes its way through all six commanders' dugouts along the line in no time at all, it seems. The observation officers, spying on the regimental position with field glasses and sketch pad, are not without some of the responsibility. In any case, the position is not hermetically sealed. There's a perpetual coming and going, 
During the quiet morning hours, staff officers come around and make work, much to the fury of the poor grunt, who has just lain down following last watch, only to hear the call. The divisional commander is present for the trench, and plunges out of his dugout, looking fairly impeccable once more. Then, after that, there is the pioneer in the trench construction and the drainage officer, all of them carrying on as if the trench existed only for their particular specialism. The artillery officer gets a little frosty perception later, as he seeks to hold a trial barrage, because no sooner has he got it, taking his periscope with him, having stuck it up out of the trench at various points, like an insect its antenna, then the British artillery will start up, and the infantry are always the ones who will catch it. And then the commanders of the advance party and the entrenching detachments put in their appearance as well. They sit in the platoon commander's dugout until it's completely dark, drinking grog and smoking and playing the Polish lotto until they've cleaned up as thoroughly as a band of rats. Then, at some ungodly hour, a little chappy comes ghosting down the trench, creeps up behind the sentry, shouts, GAS ATTACK! in his ear, and counts how many seconds it takes for the fellow to put on his mask. He obviously is the gas attack protection officer. In the middle of the night, there's one more knock on the plank door of the dugout. What's going on in here? You asleep already? Here, will you sign a receipt of twenty knife rests and half a dozen dugout frames? The carrying party is here. So, on quiet days anyways, there's a continual coming and going, enough finally to introduce the poor inhabitant of the dugout to Psy. Oh, if only there'd be a bit of bombardment so we can get some peace. It's true, though. A couple of heavy bombs only contribute to the overall feeling of coziness. We're left to ourselves, and the tedious pen-pushing stops. Lieutenant, permission to take my leave, sir? I'm going on duty in half an hour. The clay walls of the Parados are gleaming in the drying rays of the sun, and the trench itself completely in shadow by now. Soon the first flares will go up, and the night sentries will begin their back and forth. The new day for the trench warriors begins. This has been Chapter 4 of Ernst Jüner's Storm of Steel.